you're wrong. <laughs> All right, let me get right to the to the intros, and then we've got uh, some great discussion. And I just told them, let's have fun, just like that documentary was fun. Let's have fun if we're going to. Uh, Barry Goldwater Jr., the Goldwaters, of course, are legendary in Arizona. Uh, Barry's great-grandfather, Michael Water, immigrated from Poland to the United States in the 1840s, landing in San Francisco. In 1850, he began a mercantile business, traveling by wagon throughout, this, uh, throughout mining camps in California, Nevada, and Arizona. He settled that year in Prescott, Arizona, where he opened his first dry goods store, uh, which through the efforts uh, of his uh, sons, Barrett and Morris, and grandsons, Bob and Barry, would expand into a tremendously successful clothing business. Like his father before, Barry Jr. worked in the family business. However, about the time he graduated from Arizona State University with a, um, a Bachelor of Science in Marketing and Management, the stores were sold, leaving Barry with the decision to make about his future. He moved to Los Angeles and became a stockbroker and eventually a partner in what was then the Los Angeles securities firm of Noble Co. In 1964, uh, that year found uh, Barry crisscrossing the country, campaigning for his father. The outcome of that effort is well known, certainly to you who haven't watched the documentary, but its impact on Barry is not. It set the pattern of public service that he would soon undertake. At the age of 30, Barry ran for Congress and won it. He not only won that election, that was out in California, but uh, seven more elections serving 14 years representing northern Los Angeles County. He and his father were unique, representing one of the few instances, I think, in all of American history when both father and son were serving in Congress at the same time. He also has been, had been involved in organizations as diverse as the National Aeronautic Association, the National Wildlife Federation, and the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Congressman Goldwater retired from politics in 1983 and has been happier ever since. <laughs> And in 1984, he entered a business in Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, New York, and Phoenix, where he currently lives near his son, Barry, in Goldwater III. Uh, for the past 23 years, Barry has held positions involving finance and management, including eight years as a member of the New York Stock Exchange. Please give a warm Virginia welcome to Mr. Goldwater. is the son, of course, of the late Vice President Hubert Humphrey and the late U.S. Senator Miriam Humphrey. A lot of people forget when, when sadly, uh, Senator Humphrey, after he was re-elected to the Senate in 1970, got re-elected in 76, and unfortunately passed away from cancer. And uh, Skip's uh, mother, Muriel, was appointed to the seat. So he's the son of two U.S. Uh, senators. I don't know if you get an extra medal for that, but something, you know, you deserve something. He was elected to the Minnesota State Senate in 1972 and served as a state senator from 1973 to 1983. He was elected uh, Minnesota's Attorney General in 1982 and served in the office for four consecutive terms from 1983 to 1999. So technically I should call you General, but I'm going to, I'm going to invoke my privilege as moderator and call you Skip. In 1988, he ran for the same U.S. Senate seat that his father and his mother previously held, but that was a very Republican year. 1988. By the way, this is today, the uh, 20, let's see, 26, no, 26th anniversary, is it, of the election of George H.W. Bush in that, uh, in that election. Actually, that's the day he lost. I'm sorry to bring it up. But uh, <laughs> it was a big Republican year. I think you'll agree with that. Uh, and uh, you were defeated by Senator David Durenberger, whose son I taught here, by the way. It's a small world. Uh, of course, politics is in his blood, and he stayed very active at the national level and in Minnesota. In fact, he has his grandson here. Um, his grandson is Matthew Kennedy. Where is Matthew? There you are, right over there. He's young, and he's naturally considering coming to the University of Virginia. <laughs> Mr. Humphrey is a senior fellow at the University of Minnesota where he teaches public health policy and law, and he's also a consultant to Tonine Partners, a Minnesota-based communications and public affairs group. He also served as president of the Minnesota chapter of the AARP, you're too young, uh, and is 
is currently a member of the board of directors of the National AARP. Please join me in giving another warm Virginia ball to the students. It's yeah. all. <laughs> you see, moderators never run the discussion. And you see, that's why they didn't have a debate, because that was what was going to happen. So let me, let me start with a couple of questions. So first, uh, to both of you, uh, just tell us how old you were and exactly how you participated in the campaign of 64. And Mary, I'm going to start with you. And I, first thing I want to know, because I've always wanted to know this, I've seen that clip of Richard Nixon sitting next to you at the convention. And I noticed Nixon didn't applaud the line, extremism and defensive victory is no vice, defensive liberty is no vice. And he turned to you and he said something. What did he say? That's what he asked me. What did he say? <laughs> Right. And I, I, well, we'll get back into some of uh, what the uh, 
Gillum is all about and some of the things that I think frame uh, the issues that uh, were presented. Uh, but I want to compliment you. Uh, really, it's just an absolutely wonderful program. The documentary, I think, highlights uh, some key changes that took place. I think it's important for people to begin to understand that. And frankly, I think it emphasizes properly the changes that took place in the Republican Party at that time and the challenges that were faced and what happens in uh, politics when parties divide. And, uh, Lord sakes, the Democrats have done that to themselves sometimes, too. <laughs> well, four years later, your father experienced that yes. in 1968. Absolutely. Let, let, me, let me ask both of you now. You watched this, I guess, a couple times. I think we sent you an early version of it, and you just watched it again. And of course, you were, we can only fit so much in 56 minutes. Um, yeah. we, we, let, we could have done, well, we were given the opportunity to be Ken Burns and have 14 hours of uh, <laughs> program. Uh, but I know we left a lot out, and I really want to hear your reactions. What did we leave out that you consider particularly important, or were there misrepresentations of your fathers in there? Well, Professor Sever, uh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> You know, if we just back up, the 1960s was a, a time of cultural dissent and political unrest. It was the Beatles, 1965 Mustang convertible, LSD was prominent, uh, Vietnam War was going on. It was an interesting period of time in our, in our, in our, in our country. But if you could allow me to be the professor and you, the student, and grade your presentation. Uh, God, <laughs> I would be glad to accommodate. Go ahead. Let me just say that uh, your written paper, which you submitted earlier, uh, October 27, is entitled "How Goldwater Changed Campaigns Forever," was in Politico. I would give it an A. Oh. Keep going. Because, yeah. <laughs> because you were honest in analyzing the 1965 64 race as being one which realigned the political parties. And that was a significant point that happened in the 60s. You can talk about marketing all the time. Marketing always changes, and it always changes in political parties. Now, as as it comes to your second thesis, which you presented to me uh, in, uh, in the form of a video uh, entitled Bombs Away, uh, I would have to uh, say that I'd give you an F. Well, that's PBS. That's the <laughs> I would say, in a footnote, as we professors do, write in in the upper right hand corner says to comments. I think it was a bit misleading. I think it was uh, uh, lack somewhat originality. There have been oh, two or three other documentaries that followed the very same theme, we used most of the same pictures and photographs and, and footage. Uh, and uh, I think I would say it's somewhat biased. Look, what do you really think? <laughs> well, let me just tell you what I really think. Documentaries are supposed to be educational in an unbiased way so that people learn about issues and in particular it pertains to, to politics. I think you left out the most important element uh, of the 64 campaign and that was the human element. Barry Goldwater and Lyndon Johnson, who were they? And you, you misrepresented them as to who they were. I can tell you a little bit about Lyndon Johnson. He uh -huh. voted against every Civil Rights Act. Let me just read you what, uh, what uh, Barack Obama said on uh, April 10th when he spoke at Lyndon Johnson Library. During Lyndon Johnson's first 20 years in Congress, he opposed every civil rights measure that came up for a vote. And yet you portrayed him as being the uh, messiah of civil rights and, and desegregation, and, and uh, that was not, not correct. Uh, Barry Goldwater uh, was, uh, 
organized the uh, uh, NAACP in Arizona. He received the highest award of the Urban League. He desegregated the Air National Guard. He desegregated the airports, the bus terminals, and Goldwater Store. Yeah. And he voted for every Civil Rights Act, uh, except for 1964 Civil Rights Act. So there's a certain amount of, uh, I don't think you did enough research on that. So let me just stop right there and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm ever so grateful you did stop. I can't. <laughs> Actually, I gotta tell you, I love this because it's so real. Cool. It's real. And you are truly your father's son. You look like him. Uh, and, and you're running as Goldwater. It was just like the film. So I, I'm delighted that you told the truth. And really, what he said is absolutely true. Again, we had 56 minutes. We didn't go into the career. I give you that. These people. And, but, and let me also just uh, uh, comment about Barry Goldwater. He was not a very smart politician. And smart politicians do not allow your opponents to define who you are, and he did. All right, well, that's very honest, too. Let's go. Well, I, I just want to follow up. Uh, first of all, uh, to be here with uh, Barry Goldwater is uh, uh, an absolutely wonderful experience. We've had uh, an opportunity today to talk together. We really didn't know each other uh, much before. We had met before, I believe, but uh, we really didn't know. The parallels in our family and our personal family experiences are unbelievably uh, similar. I mean, it's just amazing uh, the experiences that we've had. So, uh, number one, uh, Barry, I appreciate uh, the openness that we've had and the, uh, I hope the friendship that we've gained out of this. Uh, but, uh, Larry, I do want to also emphasize that I think one of the things that you see and you saw in the documentary is that uh, Barry Goldwater Sr. was blunt, to say the least. He said exactly what he believed. And he said it in the words that he wanted to have said. And that's, some, that's, that's to be admired, except you have to put it in the context of the time and the emotion and the history of what was happening. And in order to do that, and if I want to give you any constructive criticism, and knowing that you only had 57 minutes to do it, I suppose there's probably this much thickness on the floor that had to be cut. Yes, there was a few uh, statements here about uh, the nuclear bomb and things like that, but you have to remember those days as to what it was like. In uh, 1958, uh, we had uh, Sputnik go up. The Russians were, in a sense, ahead of us, a little beat. I can remember that going on. Uh, after that, uh, we had in 19, and uh, then we had the campaign in 1960, and what was the complaint uh, of the Democrats? That we had this missile gap. Never mind the fact that after you take a look at it, it wasn't probably really there. But there was a fear of what was happening. You had a Mr. Khrushchev who was banging on the table, telling the Americans in New York City at the United Nations, that they were going to bury us in many ways. You had all that. And then on top of that, think about this. There was still above ground, in the air, nuclear and thermonuclear tests going on. So there was this aura of this very real problem that was there. There was no nuclear test ban until a little bit later. But in 1960, there wasn't. You had uh, President Kennedy uh, campaign on the missile gap issue. And then on top of that, in 1962, remember, there was a Cuban Missile Crisis. And if you know anything about that, we came that close to nuclear holocaust. There was literally a submarine, a Russian submarine, in the Caribbean that had had orders given and the captain had ordered that a nuclear-tipped missile actually be fired. Fortunately, there was a rule that you had to have three people, the captain, the executive officer of the submarine, and the political officer. And one of the three said no. So we literally were coming very close. And it was, a, I can remember as a young person, really being scared, scared of that. As a very young person, I remember playing in uh, 
uh, and ready and in the uh, shelters, the bomb shelters in the backyard uh, of my friends in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Uh, so you had that, and then uh, on top of that, you have to remember we had the Berlin Wall go up. So the context of of this this Cold War, and then you had a person like Mr. Goldwater who stood up and said what he believed. Now you put that in that context and it becomes explosive and it becomes scary. And of course then you have the Madison Avenue politics to play right into that. And very, very much, I don't know how many of you recall, but I remember distinctly seeing that ad, uh, the Daisy ad. And it, it was shocking. It was shocking and scary. Yeah. And so we had that context. And I, so I think the documentary at least probably needed to have some embellishment along that line and to understand some of those things. On top of that, I think it did a good job of showing uh, uh, Lucy doing the Watusi. <laughs> you know, we were a little wild, but what the heck? You know, and, and on top of that, if you recall, there was this, this whole, and I, it was August 1960. Uh, Kennedy made a huge impression on me. Uh, there was this demand of young people change and to get away from this kind of danger and unfortunately Mr. Goldwater was explaining very clearly what the reality was and you put that in the context of the history of the time and the emotion and then tie into it Madison Avenue campaigning and all of a sudden things change rather dramatically so I, I think that would be certainly my uh, commentary um, and the other it. thing is is that wait, wait. <laughs> can, I, can I just say one other thing? The reality is you got, you, you probably know with this center of politics, uh, first of all, you got to understand, I do have some Humphrey genes, so that means we go on. That's what, that's, that's the whole point. But the reality <laughs> is, <laughs> that politics is, <laughs> if I can just do it, have like one last one sentence. Go ahead. That politics is a rough and rugged sport. It always has been. And it gets hard. It's hard today. It was hard this past Tuesday. And it was hard then. And you've got to understand, that's the kind of bluntness in our business of politics and in this democracy. But out of it comes freedom and a true democracy. Skip, I can understand that last Tuesday was hard for you, but we had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> you won. <laughs> No, I don't, did, oh, you just, okay, you were just interrupting it. <laughs> First of all, I just want to say to my friends at PBS, I hope you took down this constructive criticism and learned a lot from it. Because I want to see, I want to see better from you next year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, I want to transition, i got to get this in, because we've only got a certain amount of time here. Uh, thank God. Uh, <laughs> I want to transition to Lyndon Johnson, because uh, he was at the heart of 1964, not, and with all due respect to Gary Goldwater, with all due respect to Hubert Humphrey, uh, he was at the heart of 1964. And I'm going to ask you several questions related to Lyndon Johnson. It was, it's obvious then, it was, it's been obvious ever since, that your father had a, an extreme distaste for Lyndon Johnson personally. I mean, and I want to find out why. That's the question to you. And then, Skip, so you can be thinking about it. Your father had the great fortune and misfortune to be elected vice president and to work under, and believe me, at that time, vice presidents worked under the president, to work under Lyndon Johnson for four years. And we want to find out what that was like. Barry? You know, uh, my father didn't hate anyone. I never heard him use the word hate, but he did dislike Lyndon Johnson because he felt he was dishonest. Uh, and he especially dishonest because of the way he went around bringing everybody in arms and, and forcing people through various means to uh, come around his way of thinking. Uh, he didn't care for Lyndon Johnson because he didn't really live in a, with a philosophy. He was an opportunist. He was somebody who was ambitious and would probably run over anyone who stood in his way. Uh, let's see what else. 
Well, what about all these personals, the scandals that were thrown up in that, in that long uh, ad that was shown in living rooms around America? The Bobby Baker uh, scandal? You know, uh, there was two scandals that I remember. There was the Jenkins, yeah. Walter, Walter Jenkins, Jenkins, who was caught in a bathroom, and uh, Bobby Baker, who wound up being a crook. Both of these gentlemen were close friends with Lyndon Johnson. And the campaign staff wanted to run campaign ads um, emphasizing this. And my father put a stop to it. He said, absolutely not. Uh, I remember reading something that he wrote, something about he thought that campaigns could be clean and honest and people could get along. He was a, a pretty straight guy, very honest. Uh, people respected him for his kindness and his generosity. When he died in 1998, over 4,000 people turned out for the funeral, and over 30 United States senators flew in to Arizona to attend his funeral. So he had a lot of friends, and he was a, he was a good man. He had over 10,000 hours as a pilot, flew every airplane that the military ever built. He was a good father, but uh, he didn't like people who were not honest, and he didn't think. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was very honest. It, he was a hypocrite for, because of the civil, civil rights votes. And for some 20 years as a, as a legislator, he voted. He was a segregationist. He was from the South. And that was, that was the, uh, that's how they, the senators voted. Uh, it wasn't until 1957 that he then changed his stripes, recognizing that it would be politically opportunity for him to do so. Not because of anything that he, he, uh, he believed. Now, I don't question the fact that I think Lyndon Johnson was compassionate. I think he, he cared about the poor and the disadvantaged. And uh, the only, being a liberal, the only way he knew how to fix it was for the federal government. Instead of expanding opportunity and individual initiative and the free enterprise system and the system that made this country great, he reverted to what we ran away from, totalitarianism, to bring the federal government to solve all these problems. So right again, Professor, there's a differentiation between the philosophies of our two political parties, which would make a great documentary, and I'm going to start it. Now, obviously, your father had precisely the opposite philosophy famous for some of his speeches about uh, taking care of those in the shadows of life. How would you respond to that? But mainly I want you to respond to my question about Lyndon Johnson. Because I, uh, I, I think you have to go a ways back in uh, Hubert Humphrey's uh, history. Let's just start in 1948. Uh, here's a young mayor, upstart from Minneapolis, <coughs> represents the minority plank of civil rights stands up, gives a speech that says it is time for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadow of states' rights and into the bright sunshine of human rights. And uh, that was a reflection of some of the work that he had done previously as mayor, but it was a commitment he made for his life. Now you go fast forward and he gets elected to Senate, gets to know Mr. Goldwater's father, they become friends, they aren't uh, political allies by any means at all, but they have a working relationship, as many Congress people did in those days, where they could do their politics, and at the end of the day, they could go and have a beer, or a bourbon, or whatever. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think we do that very much today. But as you continue going forward, and you need to go through that history a little bit, you know that there are times that uh, this this goal of my father to change the history of the country with regards to civil rights. Uh, it ebbed and tied a little bit, but he knew that you had to count votes. And so as what happened is he, he begins to uh, organize and to work with that whole coalition of uh, more moderate liberal uh, senators and Congress people. And Lyndon Johnson knows in order to get something done, he needs a partner. Well, ultimately, in 64, uh, that's what happened. Now, were they great, loving partners of each other? I'm not so sure. 
but they all, both of them knew they had to have each other to get something done. In the meantime, my father had also had that experience of campaigning against and then for uh, President Kennedy. He learned very quickly that you need the partnership of a president as well as a Senate and a House. If you want to have a nuclear test ban treaty, you maybe need to talk into the quiet ear of a president who says, I think I have an idea. The next thing you know, you get a nuclear test ban treaty. If you want to have food for peace, you need to talk to a president, begin to work with him, and the next thing you know, you've got food for peace. Any number of other issues. The partnership of Humphrey and Kennedy was very strong, but he learned in that that you need to have that partnership. So the next thing you know, we're still trying to get civil rights done. And Mr. Johnson, there's all sorts of things that we can talk about, Mr. Johnson and Humphrey, and not all are pleasant by any means. Vietnam. Vietnam, a little bit of problem with Vietnam. <laughs> but uh, in civil rights, the, the bottom line, the bottom line was that the president knew that there was going to be a filibuster, and that filibuster had never been broken before, and it was by the southern states. And he needed someone to head that up, and that's where Hubert Humphrey came in and was managing that, uh, that bill all the way through. Had to make concessions to Mr. Dirksen in order to get the ultimate numbers because you had to have 60, 67 votes to break a filibuster. And they had to organize that. So the question of you raise about, well, what about living with Lyndon Johnson? They were close in many ways, but they were very different in many ways. But they both understood, as I think Senator Goldwater did, that in politics, you, you've got to learn what you have in common with the other. You have to learn how you're going to gain the relationship of trust that allows you to do the work that you want to do while understanding that the other individual has uh, an agenda too that you get done. And so that's how I think uh, Johnson Humphrey came together. Now, it had consequences, consequences that ultimately uh, did not provide for the election of my father to the presidency. On Vietnam. On Vietnam. Vietnam. Yeah. In, yeah. For sure on Vietnam. The other thing that I would mention, as, as want of a Humphrey would be to continue, <laughs> is that the other part was not only the nuclear issue that was there, but if you recall in the 60s, there was this national emotion of change, of civil human rights change that was going to take place. And President Johnson very adroitly understood that was what was going to happen. So if that horse is going to run, how are you going to ride it? And I give him credit for the work that he did pulling that around. He may not have voted when he was in the South and there were segregationist policies and all the rest. He may not have voted in the right place. But at the right time, with the right circumstances, with the right public emotion, he was there to help Hubert Humphrey and others elect, and as, Lynn, uh, as Linda Bird Johnson said, put it on the books. And how do you define hypocrite? Pardon? <laughs> how do you define hypocrite? You don't need a moderator. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep going. You know, we're going to we're going to let him not define hypocrite. <laughs> You know, we, we joked about the fact that Linda Johnson wouldn't debate Barry Goldwater. I have read different things over the years, and I want to know whether it's actually true that President Kennedy, toward the end of his life, when he realized, in all probability, Goldwater would be his opponent in 64, did he really tell your father that, uh, that they would travel together on Air Force One and stop in various cities and hold debates there? They, they didn't get along well personally, didn't they? Yes, they did. Uh, they served on the uh, Senate Rackets Committee uh, as his key follower, I think, was the chairman. And they were investigating uh, organized labor crime. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa. I can't remember who else. He's not buried here. Interesting. <laughs> but they served on the committee together, and Robert Kennedy was the uh, uh, counsel. counsel. And so he got to know the Kennedys quite well, and then when John F. Kennedy became president, uh, my dad would go down to the White House and they would uh, sit there and sip bourbon together. Uh, it just so happened that uh, my father 
was afflicted with the same disease that uh, John Kennedy was. I'm not sure what the name of it is, but it produced too much calcium. You get two more, two more choices. <laughs> no, they, they, too much calcium in the bone yeah. in the joints. Oh, oh, yeah. right. And, 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 and uh, sometimes, you know, they'd all operate and chip out the calcium and sew it back up. Uh, but they had the same doctor, Janet Trevell. And my dad would go down to the White House and they'd both lay out on, on the floor there and she would inject them with some steroids or something. Hmm. So they, they had a good relationship. And, uh, and uh, one time, one time uh, Kennedy, after coming off of a press conference, get, got beat up by the press, came in and to the Oval Office, my dad was waiting for him. Kennedy came in and says, do you want this goddamn job? <laughs> but it's, it was true. They had honestly talked about running against each other, and uh, they decided they would get one airplane, one makeup artist, uh, one camera, and, and travel around the country and debate each other. And uh, they were going to do that. But when uh, the president was assassinated, it just took all the wind out of my dad's sails. Well, that's fascinating. I had never heard the steroid part of it. So, that, to me, that's news. I can think of some baseball players who would like to hear that. Uh, well, that is that is absolutely fascinating. Uh, we're being told we need to wrap up, which I hate to do. I'd like to continue, but I'm going to end on one other question. Uh, as successful as both of your fathers were, they're part of American history. They had millions of followers. They impacted politics right up to the current day, both of them. In the end, they both lost presidential races. And, you know, I always remember uh, what, uh, uh, what Walter Mondale, I think, historians, he called uh, George McGovern. Yeah, they both lost 49 states. So Mondale called McGovern and said, you know, boy, I'm really down. This is right after the 84 campaign. You know, how long does it take for you to, to bounce back, get over this? And McGovern said, when it happens, I'll call you. <laughs> <laughs> so how did they? adjust to knowing they had done, you know, great things and they had all these millions of followers, but they didn't achieve that great goal. How did they bounce back and both of them eventually run for the Senate again and take part in yeah. the process? Tell us about that. Well, uh, Senator Goldwater uh, was a man of, uh, uh, he was a man of the West. He was strong. He was independent. He stood up on his own two feet and told you what he thought. And, and a lot of confidence in himself, and I don't think he skipped a beat. He came home, he, he had to take off four years, he, he resigned from the Senate, which uh, Lyndon Johnson did not do when he ran for uh, vice president. Lyndon Johnson ran for two offices at the same time. My father to resigned from the Senate to run for president, and then after he was beat, he had to sit out uh, another couple years before he could run again. And he just kept himself busy by continuing to speak out on, uh, on uh, conservative principles. And uh, one thing I was, I thought was interesting is he organized a group of financial types to buy Campbellback Mountain, which is right in the center of Phoenix, because the fear of some of our more excitable entrepreneurs to build restaurants with cable cars up on top of this beautiful mountain. He organized and bought that Camelback Mountain and gave it to the, the state of Arizona. So he uh, it, it didn't really. He knew he wasn't going to win, and uh, he uh, he just he, he just kept on kept on going, doing what he did. Fantastic. How about this? Well, in uh, 1968, lost, and uh, he was uh, uh, out of a job, a public job, for a long for the first time in a long time. And, uh, but very shortly, he was able to return to the Senate uh, when Senator Eugene McCarthy decided not to run for re-election. And so he got right back in the, uh, in the pack. And I remember very clearly, I was now in law school, and uh, he called me one time and said, well, what do you think? And I said, Dad, I've been reading a very interesting history book about uh, Andrew Jackson and about, uh, it, it wasn't Burr, it was, uh, who was the next president after Jackson? Uh, Mark Van Buren. Yes, Mark Van Buren. And Van Buren had gone back into the Senate as well. And some of his best work was done after uh, that. Uh, it 
was uh, after that period of time. And I said, if he can do that, so can you. And away he went back and uh, took on all sorts of things and continued his efforts. So it was a it was a unique thing, but it was part. It was in his blood. There was no way, as I think, uh, uh, in Mr. Goldwater's blood, to serve others and to do it as well as they possibly could. The other thing that I think is a little unfortunate in these days is that, as you saw in the uh, documentary here, it may very well have been one of the first times where we had a clear distinction of the ideological differences that people held, that presidential candidates held. But if you watch how things happened, they were still able to work together on a number of things to get the jobs done. And unfortunately, we still have that ideological divide, but for any number of other reasons, which I hope your center of politics will continue to explore, we seem to have lost our way in being able to come to grips with real problems, literally down to are we going to fill the potholes of our highways. Uh, and so, on the one hand, there was very strong ideological differences, and I think Mr. Goldwater ably, bluntly, put it forward. But I know that they work together on any number of other things, and I would only hope that our country and our politics could come back together to understand that it's not a bad thing to have a difference of opinion, but it is a bad thing to not get the job done. get the job done, compromise, uh, make it happen. And we want to thank, obviously, through you, them, for being such great Americans. And I think they, they did a terrific job in giving you to us, because you also have done great things in your lives, and you represented uh, your families very, very well here. We appreciate your coming all the way to Charlottesville for the film festival. Uh, we, we have been told we need to vacate the auditorium quickly because of another event, but we're going to meet anybody who wants to chat out in the lobby, and I'll be damned if they'll throw us out of that.